my personal feeling is today's world is so polarized and so polarized along ideological lines that it would never happen what i have realized is reservation by itself doesn't end any problem it's a very long and bitter fight why is umar khan did not getting bail till today mary roy was an extraordinary woman um an icon in the state of kerala or, or i would say for the whole of india also you see i feel that the relevance of the constitution came to the foreground after the caa act came into force by the movements which began in shaheen bagh in in delhi answer your question are we late the answer is yes we are late Welcome to the Q Law Point. Today, we have with us one of the strongest human rights lawyers of the country, Indira J. Singh Ma'am. In this episode, we some young lawyers of the Kerala Bar interacting with Senior Advocate Sri Indira J. Singh Ma'am. Welcome Ma'am. It's an honor to meet you Ma'am. Ma'am, you are designated as a Senior Counsel in the, age of, in the year of 1986. So, you have been Senior Counsel for last 38 years. You have seen many Senior Lawyers who only do high profile cases. But you are do you are on literally on the street for that pavement dollars case uh, you fight for bhopal gajri uh, bhopal gas tragedy victims and so on so what gives you this much strength to fight ma'am well first of all i want to tell you that uh, i was designated by invitation uh, in 86 and it might surprise you to know that uh, i was recommended for designation by some of my opponents some of the lawyers who i used to oppose in the courts now this tells you something about that era you know surprisingly uh, you tend to think of history as progress but uh, what i have noticed is that in today's world there is so much polarization that i i would not see anybody of uh, any of my opponents recommending me for designation so <laughs> rather than seeing uh, an advance uh, in relation to things like sexism and uh, you know male chauvinism i have actually seen a backward movement in relation to these issues so many people ask me very often that oh in your day and age it might have been very difficult but uh, my personal feeling is today's world is so polarized and so polarized along ideological lines that it would never happen that the people whose ideology you oppose they recognize your talent and they say yes you're somebody who should be designated so this is about the designation since you asked about it now to come to the motivation to come to the uh, inspiration so yes i think one reason is because i was a woman because i had no one in the legal profession no parent no relative no friend uh, to whom i could turn for support and i think that has a very liberating influence you know because you have no role models you are your own role model you're free to fashion your own uh, destiny you're free to fashion your own journey in life so that was one thing that gave me a lot of strength and a lot of courage i realized that i'm not accountable to anybody um, in the legal profession i don't have to be this way or be that way i can be the way i want to be that was one uh, liberating thought now the other thing of course is you know that uh, somewhere down the line i had visited uh, the uk and there i was exposed to a lot of movements student movements anti vietnam war movements the um, upheaval in france in 1980 1968 and so on and so forth all this had a definite impact on me but apart from the movements i saw changes happening in the legal profession okay that is very important because after all i'm a lawyer and i knew that whatever contribution i could make has to be inside the courtroom outside the courtroom there are many other people making a contribution i can connect with them but my contribution has to be inside the courtroom so i saw what were called as law centers in the uk and they were like walk in law centers you can walk in and get legal advice free 
and these were funded by the corporation. And uh, I made a decision that when I come back to India, I'm going to try and start something like this. And that is when we founded the Lawyers Collective. My colleague here, she's one of the founding members. And the idea was this, to have a walk-in center. By, and it has always been a dream with me that in the legal profession, we must have something like we see, like when you go to a hospital, for example, there are so many different departments, so many different specializations, and you go for the specialization which you need. Now, imagine if you had a center like that uh, for law, okay? So you would have a group of lawyers who specialize in tenancy law, dealing with people who are going to be evicted by their landlords. Then you have another group which is uh, women facing domestic violence. Then you can have another group facing homelessness. And then you can have so many different uh, people's issues under one roof, like how you have a hospital under one roof. Now, this is an unfulfilled dream. It has never happened in this country. But when, uh, you know, we had the Lawyers Collective had filed a petition in the Supreme Court to implement the National Services Authority Act. You see, the act was passed under Article 35A of the directive principles of state policy, but it was not brought into force for more than 10, 15 years. So we filed a simple petition saying bring this act into force. So before the petition could be heard, the act was brought into force. So at least there was a glimmer of hope that something will change, something will change. The legal services will be available to people who need it. But even that really has not happened. And I think there's money. There's no shortage of money. But I think the reason it has not happened is because not enough respect is being given to legal aid lawyers. They are not paid properly. There is no system of public defenders which could be there, which could have come under the umbrella of the National Legal Services Authority and State Legal Services Authority. So maybe it'll happen in the future. Maybe young people like you will make it happen. As you generally points out, the caste profile and gender profile of the bench are very important. Mm. Do you think the life experience of a lawyer or the life of experience of a person is important uh, in the decision-making process when they are on benches? See, oh yes, I'll tell you. But before the decision-making process, uh, I want to talk about the connect between the person who has a problem, who is the litigant and the judge. So I will give you this small example, which I gave yesterday also to the audience. I was representing Rupandel Bajaj, the first case of sexual harassment in this country. And she objected to the DG of police having misbehaved with her. So when her case came up for hearing in the Supreme Court of India, it got listed before a bench of two male judges. So she asked me the question. She said, uh, Madam, the Supreme Court has held that all sexual harassment cases, there should be a woman who is the chairperson of the committee. Why is it that my case is not listed with, at, before at least one woman judge? And the answer I had to give her was that because in the Supreme Court, there is not a single woman judge. So for a long period of time, the Supreme Court existed without a woman judge. After some of the women judges had retired. Now, this is the connect, the connect which people feel uh, with a judge. Now, it does not mean that a woman judge will decide in favor of the, a woman litigant at all. But there is a feeling amongst them that we got justice. If they, if they feel that they have a person on the bench who knows their life's journey, which is this, in my opinion, this is the reason why it's very important to have scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, OBC, people from all religious communities represented on the benches of the high courts and Supreme Court, and even of the lower judiciary. I'm told in Kerala and Tamil Nadu, there is reservation for women and different castes and communities in the judiciary, but it's not the case everywhere. But the thing is that what I have realized is reservation by itself doesn't end any problem. It's a very long and bitter fight. 
and uh, you can be in the job in a reserved category and look, be looked down upon. And uh, people will say, oh, you know, this person belongs to reserved category, that so unless that self-pride movement, I would call it a movement for self-pride and there have been a lot of movements in the south of India, Narayana Guru if I'm not mistaken in uh, the state of Kerala, uh, unless those movements uh, are initiated, reservation by itself is, is not uh, uh, going to solve these problems. Even, even the Atrocities Act, I have dealt with a lot of cases de dealing with the Atrocities Act and it's very disgusting to see that uh, the people in the senior levels are the decision makers and uh, when they sit in judgment in disciplinary proceedings over their juniors who happen to be scheduled caste or scheduled pride, their attitudes come out. And uh, on paper, it looks as if they're taking a decision which is impartial, which is based on the fact, but you can notice this uh, bias, element of bias which operates in their minds. And it's, 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 as a lawyer also, I've found it very painful to see it. But uh, there is uh, uh, an emerging group of uh, lawyers from, at least I've seen in Delhi, I've seen it in the Supreme Court, from scheduled cars, scheduled tribes, who are now trying to make a successful living in, in our higher courts. Ma'am, I'm talking about the independence of the judiciary, Mero. There are many communities, including the women, SCST, minorities, and other segments of society are being left out in the appointment process. Don't you think, ma'am, the system, the collegium needs to be a little more transparent? Yeah, it needs to be entirely transparent, not a little more. It needs to change. The collegium system needs to change. And um, so the primary example of that is what happened at the appointment of uh, V. Gauri uh, in Tamil Nadu. And a very enterprising group of lawyers, some of whom are my friends, uh, they decided to challenge the appointment. And it might interest you to know that the challenge was made before the oath of office was administered. And the challenge was mainly on the ground that she had indulged in hate speech and all her videos were available online. And uh, she had said things like Islam is green terror and uh, Christianity is white terror. And uh, I fail to understand how her appointment was cleared by the collegium. A direct finger is pointed by me to the collegium, I would say. But how was this appointment cleared? Unfortunately, even when uh, we uh, challenged it in court. It was challenged in court. Can you imagine how obscene it sounds that while the hearing is going on, uh, that this appointment uh, should not go through, uh, the, the judge was being sworn in. What would be the morale of the lawyers arguing the case? That uh, we are arguing a case that don't administer oath of office. And it, the oath of office is being administered as we are arguing. Even that much decency was not shown to the judiciary that you wait. And the issue got, uh, you know, politicized. And uh, people thought that we were opposing it because she was a member of the women's wing of the BJP. But that was not the point. The point was her own utterances, which amount to hate speech. So what is the point? of these kind of appointments being cleared by the collegium system. And on the other hand, we know that Justice Qureshi, who was due for appointment to the Supreme Court, was not appointed only because he happens to be Muslim and secular. So the system is uh, wrong. It is wrong. It needs change. You need to have more transparency in the appointment. And, you need to appoint people who have demonstrable commitment to the Constitution of India. Ma'am, uh, you have uh, written an open letter to the Honorable Chief Justice of India regarding uh, the handbook issued by the Honorable Supreme Court. Uh, Ma'am, uh, in which uh, you have uh, talked about uh, the sexist remarks women lawyers face 
inside and outside the corridors. And also in which, ma'am, you have mentioned that uh, the loud female lawyers are treated as aggressive. And at the same time, the male lawyers doing so is considered as uh, top lawyers. And uh, ma'am, uh, what, uh, what, what are the changes uh, needed to make this profession more women friendly? Yeah, well, <laughs> well, the first thing I would tell you is don't, don't get put off if somebody tells you you're aggressive. That's, that, is the, that is the issue, that is the thing that is required to bring about the change, okay? Somebody recently mentioned to me, one of my friends, <coughs> I have a junior who just went to Columbia, qualified. Uh, she's incidentally scheduled tribe. And uh, she will be coming back to India, hopefully, to practice. And one of my friends, and I made a remark, you know, somebody said, oh, madam, your junior has qualified. And so I made a remark. I said, you know, all my juniors are smarter than I am. You must remember that. So my friend responded by saying, look here, madam, uh, what I have noticed about your juniors is all of them have learned one thing from you, and that is they have learned to speak up. They have learned to stand on their own feet. They have learned to not be intimidated by judges or by their male colleagues. And that is the contribution that you have made to your juniors. Now, whether they are smarter than you or not smarter than you is a different issue. We can debate that. But this one thing is not debatable, that your juniors stand up on their own feet and they talk. And uh, recently, one of these journalist friends of mine, she told me she was a young journalist. She was coming to the Supreme Court as a legal journalist. She was uh, not being allowed to come in and all. And she reminded me some of these things I don't remember myself. She actually, she reminded my partner. She told my partner, I want to interview Ms. Jai Singh. And uh, I said, why does she want to interview me? She said, oh, you know, she remembers something like when she was not being allowed to come to the Supreme Court, I told her, I said, you walk as if you own the Supreme Court of India. So, um, so ma'am, this is the only thing that I think will make a change. Walk as if you own that courtroom. It's yours. Ma'am, the Hindu right has made some headway in Kerala during the post Shabrimala judgment period. It was during this period the so-called progressive politicians in Kerala started talking about the relevance of the constitution here. So my question is that, do you think that our polity waited till the Modi regime to speak about the relevance of the constitution? Are we really late, late for this? You see, I feel that the relevance of the constitution came to the foreground after the CAA Act came into force by the movements which began in Shaheen Bagh in, in Delhi. We noticed that suddenly uh, all the protesters were carrying a copy of the constitution in their hand and uh, they were saying that we are also citizens. But I think to answer your question, are we late? The answer is yes, we are late. Uh, you know, there are other countries in the world, especially South Africa, where uh, they got liberation from apartheid when they got independence, where they made a special effort to make sure that the constitution was translated into languages available to the ordinary people and it was made available to everybody. Uh, special efforts were made. I have not been there, but I'm told that in the constitutional courts of South Africa, you will find the history of the struggle against uh, apartheid displayed on the walls of their Supreme Court, of their Constitution Court. Women who were raped, their clothes are actually displayed, you know, because they don't want future generations to forget what were the sacrifices their ancestors made in order to get that independence. So that has not happened in India, in my opinion. I feel that uh, many of us took our liberties for granted. We took our independence for granted. We took our freedom of speech for granted. And although in, during the emergency in 1975, our civil liberties were suspended, but they were promptly restored after uh, an election. So, and we have seen in our lifetime vibrant movements against authoritarianism. 
so but still we have taken the constitution for granted and uh, i think the correct answer to your question in my opinion would be that we cannot take it for granted we have to and uh, you made a very interesting point about shabrimala it's true uh, uh, the again you see the see the irony of it i was representing bindu who was a scheduled caste woman the first one to climb up the uh, hill and uh, pay her respects to the deity over there she's been driven out of kerala okay she's been uh, attacked physically emotionally mentally and uh, if you were to see the supreme court uh when the review petitions were some 200 review petitions have been filed uh to to review that judgment which is a historic judgment even yesterday at the meeting i quoted from justice uh, chandrachut's opinion where he says that there were two struggles going on at independence one was the struggle for freedom from colonial rule and the other was the struggle for social reform what happened to the struggle for social reform so the whole temple entry movement was part of the struggle for social reform and yet when bindu went to shabrimalai the whole of the hindu establishment in kerala woke up opposed it filed some 200 review petitions and uh, the the then chief justice referred the matter for review to a bench of nine judges so we have taken uh, a lot for granted i i never thought in my lifetime i will see something like this i i thought who is going to oppose the equality for women nobody will oppose equality for women but equality for women is one of the most highly opposed ideologies in this country um usually when there is a progressive movement uh, taking place in legal side there is also a movement Uh, in the uh, social side for regressive movement so how much do we need progressive movement to be together legally and socially there yeah in the question is of course very very important that what is the interaction between uh, legal movements and uh, social movements social meaning uh, you can say even protest movements you can say civil disobedience movements uh, only this morning i was listening to um, a youtube uh, video of uh, there was this young woman of indian origin i'm not sure whether she's an indian citizen or an american citizen qualifying her graduation from harvard and uh, she was selected to give a speech uh, at at the at the graduation function and she gave a formal speech and believe it or not i saw it i was so pleasantly surprised in in the sleeve of her gown she had hidden a little piece of paper which she took out and she read and she said as i stand here graduating 13 of my colleagues are not going to graduate why because they spoke up in favor of palestine so you're talking about india but look at the way and she said i'm shocked and uh, i'm uh, disappointed at the way the right to freedom of speech and expression is being suppressed in the united states of america which is supposed to be the land of freedom so uh, all, all it's a, it's a great example of how an insider used her position to stand up for her views okay so i think the answer to your question is if i were to answer your question i would say i'll come back to the question my role is to articulate these ideas of protest inside a courtroom okay and if you are you ask me where do you get my strength from i will get my strength from outside the courtroom so it is the experience of life it gives me the strength to say what i want to say inside the court ma'am um, the supreme court in the case of arnesh kumar was a state of bihar had issued guidelines to prevent arbitrary arrest especially in cases related to section 498a of ipc and recently supreme court in 
uh, Achin Gupta was the state of Haryana had asked the uh, requested the central government uh, legislature to make necessary changes in the recently uh, formulated BNS section 85 and 86 so do you think such a change is required yes Avinash Kumar is a judgment of the Supreme Court of India which demands that notice has to be given under section 41A of the criminal procedure code before any arrest is to be made. Now, changes are required, there is no doubt about it. Even the Supreme Court is pointing it out. But the problem is not there. The problem is in these so-called special statutes which to name them, NDPS, PMLA, uh, UAPA, Unlawful Activities Act, these are the three main statutes, where in the statute, the burden of proof has been reversed onto the accused to prove his or her innocence. Now, this goes counter to the guarantees of the Constitution, it goes back to her question, are we late in invoking the Constitution? There, we are given a guarantee that we are all innocent until proved guilty. Now, how can you live under a regime in which your laws are telling you that you are guilty until, until you are proved innocent? And judges are being told that you don't uh, give bail unless you are convinced that the person is prima facie not guilty. What are we doing? We are told as lawyers, don't go for mini trials at that stage of bail, but the judges will go for mini trial at the stage of granting bail. So I feel activists like us, you and me, our focus has to be on these laws. And it is extremely disappointing that the Supreme Court has not struck down these laws, despite being presented with an opportunity to strike them down. So these are all cosmetic changes. You change your three new laws and you insist on these notices being given, what happens to the rest of the people? We all know in today's India, these three laws are being weaponized to uh, attack political dissidents or members of civil society. Why is Umar Khalid not getting bailed till today? I have written an article in which I have said the maximum he can be opposed on uh, of is of causing a riot, if at all. He was involved in causing a riot, but for that you will invoke UAPA and you are invoking UAPA only because you don't want him to get bail. This is a perversion of justice and it's tragic that our courts are not able to see that justice is being perverted under their nose. This needs to change. Ma'am, uh, Mary Roy case is a landmark uh, in the history of Indian judiciary. Uh, would you like to share some experience uh, on the argument of the same. Mary Roy was an extraordinary woman, um, an icon in the state of Kerala, or, or I would say for the whole of India also. And, uh, you know, recently I shared a photograph. I will show you the photograph. I'll just show. I had gone to meet her um, before she died, obviously, uh, to Kotayam. And uh, I had done an interview with her. I have that interview. I can share it with you as well. And uh, she fought a battle which I think is going on till today. And her, uh, she was dealing with the law, the Town Caucasian Succession Act, which says the maximum that a woman can inherit from her family, her father, is 5,000 rupees. The rest of the estate will go to the son. Now, you know it's a very rich community, the Syrian Christian community. Land holdings are huge coffee plantations, etc. And she decided to challenge us. She was actually thrown out. She was actually thrown out of her parental home uh, by her brother. And uh, that's when she decided to go to Kotayam and set up the Corpus Christi School. Later, she changed the name of the school. I think she adopted a Malayalam name. And when she established a school, all the rich and the wealthy wanted to send their children over there, but they didn't have the courtesy to offer her a roof over her head when she needed one. And she brought up her children on her own. Uh, so about her case, it's, it's again her determination, her determination to fight the case, which was very attractive for somebody like me. 
and also the fact that the law was so facially discriminatory. It was discriminatory. Now, to share the experience with you, it, the case was heard by Justice Bhagwati and I think Justice Patak, if I'm not mistaken. But the judgment was a little disappointing because they did not decide the question of discrimination. What they said is, after the coming into force of the Part B state laws, the Part C state laws were repealed and the Travancore Christian Act stood repealed. So the end result was that Christian women managed to get succession rights, but we did not get a judgment which says that this is a gross discrimination against women. After that, Mary Roy also told me that after the judgment, all the priests started making lectures from the pulpit, telling the men, look here, you now better make a will, because uh, if you don't make a will, your daughter will inherit equally with your sons. And so this is the, again, goes back to your question, are we late? Yes, we are very late. We are very late in our movements, in the movements that we uh, have not been able to launch to stand up for our own rights. But the fact remains that Mary Roy was, was a very successful uh, woman who stood up for her own rights.